committee. Uh, colleagues who are here will not go through the various protocol. I can only say that the uh, protocol is observed. I would like to thank you very much for coming and attending this uh, occasion. It shows a sign of interest in what is going on at Okia University. And I would like to present myself to you to make that interest even greater. And that's why I'm titling my presentation as Makerere leading by example. So we're going to see a lot of things happening at Makerere. Makerere being a leader in the higher education sector. Makerere University working with government. Makerere University working with the government partners and all the stakeholders. But also, importantly, looking at Makerere University looking inside itself and taking advantage of its uh, brand, of its image, and the faculty and administrative and support staff that it has. Um, and also, looking at the students, I in my presentation I will make reference to this, because if you have a student population that is close to 40,000, there is a lot that you can do, not just at Makerere University, but for the rest of the higher education sector. And so, we would like to position ourselves at Makerere University with my leadership um, that we begin or we continue to live um, and work um, by leading by example. <coughs> Chair and moderator, I would like to start by appreciating the role of the Vice Chancellor and I'll put there two slides. As you know, and I can see that we have former Vice Chancellors here, you are the number one public face of this university. So I would like to ask that the Research Committee looks at me and sees the number one public image of this university and our whole <laughs> the vice chancellor is also charged with creating a strong and cohesive management team. The vice chancellor is the chief resource organizer for the university working in tandem with the various colleges and faculty and also the vice chancellor is charged with defending and expanding the community of the university. Uh, but of course you know that if you are in any institution, there are always conflicts, there are always diversion uh, uh, of views, and so that is also something that the Vice Chancellor uh, is charged with. And I can assure you that you're looking at somebody who is very good at conflict management. The second slide is just in case the science committee says that my time is up, I would like to start by what I bring to this office. I bring my liberating of extensive knowledge of Makerere University and its people. I know quite a lot of people and I would like to appreciate the support that I've been given through this process. I've received so many comments. Uh, from you on how you would like this university to be. And I, I, I promise that this will be reflected in my five years in the office of the Vice Chancellor. I bring the demonstrated capability for international networking, for academic administrative, and, and, and certainly you know that I'm one of those um, strong resource mobilizers for this university, and not just for my colleague but for this university. And thirdly, an understanding and participation in policy program development and implementation in the higher education sector. I've had the opportunity to be a government representative for uh, university councils, uh, in secondary schools, and also Makerere University representative on various organs. So I bring an understanding uh, to this field. My additional competences are personality of respect of office, strategic thinking, um, 
and, and certainly I would like to say, especially in the area of conflict management, that I've been trained very well by the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. If you want to train somebody, put them there. If they can survive, then you know that they can. So I would like to thank my colleagues in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences for participating me. Uh, but also I bring to this office humility of incompleteness and conviviality. And what I mean here is I bring to this office the, the knowledge that I don't know it all and I'm willing to learn, to listen, and I'm a very good listener, but also to do this in a spirit of friendliness uh, so that we then engage. So this is what I bring to this office. Now I'll run very quickly through my vision and also the strategic pillars knowing that the moderator is uh, looking at his watch very well. Um, Makeri University, I think the vision is as a pathfinder university in Uganda, as a leader in higher education, and I would like to note that perhaps we'll take the back seat, and I would like to bring back Makeri as a leader, not just within Makeri, but even human resource development for other public universities and private universities. So that we reposition her to be a competitive university internally. And to do this, I suggest that we have a robust strategic plan that sharpens the strategic operational and funding models. Fortunately, our strategic plan has still a year to go, and we can use that year to strategically think through what we need to do. My strategic goals, Policies review, devolution of powers, and partnership based restoration of financial uh, stability. When you, when you look at the first one, for example, you realize that there are a lot of uh, policies that are not approved. And so, one of the things that I want to do is to engage uh, with council and senate to look at these policies, take them back to, to the colleges. Uh, and, and, and really have a conversation, including students, uh, to see that we have this uh, devolution of powers, uh, partnership-based restoration, enhancing of human resources for competence-based academic and research programs, staff and student leadership, leadership structures, and of course we have the post-cultural courses. So those will be the kinds of strategic goals that I want to do, and I want to run through them very quickly. Uh, starting from the first one, as I mentioned, policy review, uh, I gave an example that only three out of ten, ten policy drafts that deal with financial management are approved. So we have seven not approved, and this goes through even with the other policies, and it gives me an advantage because then I can take back these drafts and we work together to make sure that the uh, policies that come through reflect the vision and the goals that I would like to be uh, this, this institution. So again, the rigorous engagement of colleges and staff and engagement of organs and agencies of government. We always have to remember that this is a public university and our responsibility is towards government and the nation. The responsibility is not to us, and so the engagement of organs and agencies of government become uh, very important. Now I would like to note that since 2006 I was lucky that I was the chair of the devolution committee that started the process of collegiate uh, system. We've been shy to implement you know, the collegiate system and I would like to suggest that in my term as the vice chancellor we do operationalize the collegiate uh, system. Um, so we have a commitment to implementation so that we don't, we are not into this criticizing, criticizing. We implement it, we critique, we adapt. And also within that process, strengthen the committee structure right from the department uh, to council. So the other goal as far as governance is concerned will be resetting material university leadership in the higher education sector. Um, and also positioning Makeri University as a theater uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the nation. 
And, and those will now be the sort of boxes that uh, you know reflect that particular goal uh, that is related to governance. The third element that I would like to uh, talk about, and perhaps has become the biggest thing, that a lot of times we start with finance and end with finance. So it kind of clouds our strategic thinking. And so in this regard, I'll, I'll combine, and I would like to combine financial stability with academic excellence. So that even when we venture into areas, it is for academic excellence. So if we come up with a five-star hotel, we must show that it translates into strengthening our academic um, excellence. And so restoration of stakeholder confidence, staff, student welfare, uh, equity. I know some of you are already saying incentive, incentive. Uh, so we can discuss some of those uh, things. Proper time with accountability. And so we'll have a mix of revenue generation. And I would like to uh, talk about those mix very quickly. If you look at the universities and other tertiary institutions act, it lays out uh, five areas that the university can resource mobilize. That is grants from government, voluntary contributions, grants contributions, university fees, and any other money. In my presentation, I would like to concentrate on the grants, number one, number two, and number three. And in, in my five years, I will engage uh, with the, uh, with the division and the cases here to see what we can do. So in terms of the first one, on government financing, I would like to adopt a mutual beneficiality and PPP strategy, where I'm proposing that instead of always going to government to ask for more money, more money, knowing that we are one of many priorities, I would like to suggest that I go to government to provide research innovations and advisory services for a cost. So instead of finding somebody from New York or wherever, we as McKinley University should be able to provide those advisory services. And that should bring in money, but at the same time, make our members of staff active. So then we will not have anybody striking because they are very active in doing all these kinds of things. So entering into PP arrangements to optimize the university facilities. Um, I give an example. Um, I know Professor Sabita has a set of excellence in Kavio and quite a few others. We started a conversation with the University Hospital, and I think that if we go into partnership, especially guaranteed by government, we can utilize spaces like Kavio, Guyana have a state of art medical school that also provides. And so in my time, I would like to pursue this as a more interactive and perhaps more effective way of getting money from government. Um, and so, of course, government guarantees, and then we will continue to engage government on budgetary uh, contribution. And I would like to thank the government that at least in the next budget we have committed uh, some, some money. But I think that this would be perhaps a, a better approach. And I know some universities that have done quite a lot in this way. Kenyatta uh, University built a whole medical school through the PPP arrangement with South Koreans, with government, and, and, and actually now providing probably one of the best hospitals. Uh, in, in. So we have the human resource, and what I need to, and what I want to do is to create the environment uh, that brings up uh, these, these aspects. From grants contributions, we have, I would like to grow the research grants and product development portfolio. And I'm sure that for those of you who know me, you know that I can resource mobilize for research grants. So I would like you to give me the opportunity to now be the leader in this resource mobilization for research grants and, and for all these uh, different things. Uh, and through that, I would like to suggest that every school should have a flagship program. Every school will have a flagship uh, program. Either in terms of centers of excellence 
or incubation centers and so forth. And that way, we give hope and, and, and a lot of uh, involvement of the human resource, but of course also the, the university benefits uh, financially. Convocation initiatives will be encouraged, and I'm glad uh, to know and appreciate that uh, convocation is already starting in that direction, so I, I, I will be encouraging them. Alumni chapters. My proposal is that we start by having college-based alumni chapters as we work towards the big one, because we've been doing that and we have not really done very well. So if we go from the colleges, then we, uh, I hope that we can uh, move. And of course, growing the uh, government funds uh, make you run. You only run once, now we need to be running every year. Uh, so we will be able to do this. Tuition fees. This is one thing that universities tend to fall. I'll be, I'll be there. So what I want to do there is to have innovative uh, cost sharing, but also part of the things I want to suggest is the creation of a McKinley University student scheme, where the students can actually work. There's a lot of work in the university and also with our corporate partners, so that that will make them also able to pay their tuition. It will be a scheme that allows students to have opportunities to work, either estates or corporate partners, and so they will come to the principle to say, I have not, I'm not able to pay the tuition. And so that's the kind of institutional capacity development that I'm thinking about. And so the last uh, slides uh, deal with cross-cutting issues, security of person and property. I've had occasion to talk with the students extensively in the last uh, probably one year or so, and security is a huge thing on the agenda, and that's something that I want to address. Quality assurance, data mainstreaming, infrastructure development, in terms of security, those are the kinds of issues that I'm mentioning there, and it's again, you know, four generations are becoming an issue. So security of university property and documents is going to be a huge one. In terms of quality assurance, I'm suggesting an overt quality assurance oversight framework so that we actually can tap into the institutional uh, prestige and responsibility uh, to mentor our students. And so internships and all these different kinds of things are coming through there. Gender mainstreaming will still continue to be a commitment of uh, this university under my charge. And so we will do the mentorship programs, the workplace facility care services provided, and then the gender student program initiatives on and off campus. What I notice here is that yes, we have gender policies that look at entry at McKinley, but what do we do with those young women that we give an opportunity to come to McKinley? What do we do with them when they leave? So that's the connection that I'm looking at. Finally, the and the uh, members is the infrastructure investment, both soft and, 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 and hard, optimization, optimal utilization of existing spaces. I would not say tomorrow I'm going to build the building. There's so much space in this university that we are not optimally using because people are claiming them as their own spaces. And so if we start from there, as we expand the infrastructure, then we should be able to get there. Again, what I talked about before, the government McKinley Mutual Beneficiality Partnership will help us build, and I can give an example of the building next to social sciences and the building next to the cobalt, which has really come as part of this partnership where the African Development Bank are putting their money. And then, grants, donation-based infrastructure, uh, centers of excellence, and of course also the philanthropy. And with the philanthropy members, I would like to start from home. I would like to start with the Kwagaranas of this, of this country. I would like to start uh, with all the people here. And perhaps one of the innovations we can do is that the person is named after the building, or the person is named after the hall, so that they put in money in our infrastructure development. 
So closing sentence. Those people who are here that have the money bags, I am coming. <laughs> so finally, Mr. Chairman, my presentation presents a privatized synergy of governance and evolution of power, financing and academic excellence, and infrastructure development. I would like to thank you for listening to me, and I'm waiting to be your vice chancellor. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank Professor Julia Edward for articulating his vision for this university. I think it will be prudent for us to just give him one minute to the kind of instruments and tools he will use for delivering all the strategies he has articulated for us. This is because oftentimes vice chancellors remain at only strategic
I have one question. I know there are even Chris has one question. Mr. Professor, uh, Mr. Professor Chin, we know that you are the, you are the principal school of social science and you are contesting to be the VC of uh, Macquarie University of Lunch. But we've seen that you being the school, you being the principal of social sciences, a lot of failures have happened in the school. At large. And you know that social sciences was kids of many students at large actually. First of all, uh, we are doing exams for this semester, yet we do not yet receive uh, results for last semester. We don't know if we have written, and you, you tell us you are a principal. Second of all, we pay our internship money. We don't feed on our accounts. You tell us you are a principal. Now, how will you manage? What, how will you manage to get the, the whole issue of my family in the past? And that you can manage one school for sure. You've spoken about devolution. And I think many of us in my are agree that this is necessary and inevitable. But uh, we wonder. Why is it happening in terms of uh, management level? And more specifically, what are you going to do to ensure that this actually happens? Now, well, we have been in this country for quite a time. And uh, one of the key patent issues in Makere and the impact of investors is the issue of welfare. So when sometimes you and I have had statements that the non-teaching staff in public universities can easily be picked from anywhere and be deployed and work on the global normally. And this is backed up by certain facts. For example, when issues of salary enhancement come about, these staff are left out. And if the issue of promotion, I will not say Could you please ask the question while I'm giving a talk? The question is <laughs> as a vice chancellor of this university, how do you intend, what is going to be your contribution towards this so that there is no discrimination in your administration? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things when you are an administrator is not necessarily to, uh, to succeed always. You actually judge more by how you manage your failures. Um, I've talked about the, and I'll take that together with the revolution uh, question. One of the biggest challenges we've had is that uh, uh, for quite some time we've reduced the university to finances. And so we have all been competing for finances from the university advisors office. And perhaps the university advisors has become more powerful than even the rest of the members of management. <laughs> and, and so when you get yourself into that mode, it's very, it, it sets you up uh, for, for some of the failures. Now the, the student mentioned some of the failures, like for example, we have not had the internship. That is why I'm proposing that we should decentralize, that we have the colleges why a student should be paying their entire money to the center and the operations are at the college. So, student, you are not getting internship. Please don't come to the principal. Go to the vice chancellor. <laughs> Same thing with the marks and all these different things. I'm sure that most of the units have displayed, and this has nothing to do with the humanities and social sciences, an entire university problem. 
People have made efforts to display the, the, the marks, but they can't enter them in the system. So, if you don't have your marks now, I think where you should go again is to, not to the Vice Chancellor, to the Director of Information and Technology. So basically what I'm saying is that there are certain problems that have come and find themselves at the door of the Vice Chancellor when actually they should not be the problems of the Vice Chancellor. Once we devolve, then we can be able to say that principle X is not working. So that's the point I'm, I'm making. Um, devolution, why has it worked? Again, because of the financing thing, we have inadvertently centralized and over centralized. One of the things I want to do is to expand the management, the top management, that college principles should be part and parcel of the top management. I have a college that is close to 10,000 students. The vice chancellor cannot afford not to know what I'm doing on a weekly basis. So I would like to include the principles so that then on a weekly basis, on a weekly basis, we plan for this university. And I can assure you, we will plan for this university. Well, uh, I want to save the best for us, gender issues. <laughs> Welfare and this discrimination. And I, I, I relate it to the issue that one of the issues, one of the principles, one of the things that the Vice Chancellor needs to do is team building. Now what has happened over the years is that for no in a particular blame on any one of the associations, that the associations have tended to go individually. So Mwasa is on its own, Masa is on its own, the world is not on its own. Uh, but if you look at the proposal that I'm making of mutual beneficiality and DDD, the academic staff will do what they are best at. The administrative and support staff will, will, will support the financial and administrative operations of those very centers that we're talking about. And so it's, it's, it's a collective effort. Um, and I always tell my colleagues in the humanities and social sciences that if a cleaner does not clean the lecture room, the lecturer cannot teach in that lecture room. So there should, they shouldn't be that academic staff, we are super, and the administrative staff are not. In fact, the most important person, for example, for a vice chancellor, is his driver. Because his, his life is in his hands. So if the driver is, doesn't matter, then you are in, in trouble. Lastly, Mr. Chair, on the issue of uh, gender. I'll start with uh, uh, Madame Chinani. Entry in-house exit. In the humanities and social sciences, we're trying this through the internship program. We are making partnerships with NGOs, with corporate, so that we take these students and we give priority to ladies in person. And for those of you here from social sciences, you will bear me out that we are getting almost 80% uh, level of placing our students rather than giving them letters to find where they will go. So that way we can see that we take care. Of course there is the uh, female scholarship initiative and now the, the uh, <coughs> various other uh, MasterCard and so forth. They think more about entry. And so we will through the internship and placement programs and also the work, the student work scheme that I propose to make sure that we take care of entry, in-house and exit. Um, so the, 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 the issue about top management I've, I've already talked about it in terms of the 
expansion and other things. Sexual harassment. One of the things that I've talked about is the revitalization of the community structure, right from department to council. So we will revitalize the community structure, we will make sure that the community representation is there and also the student representation on those committees. We will also work and we will work with the student guild to, to again see how the students are engaged. And there is this issue about the presidencies on campus. You know, every time now you're walking, every other person you have to say your excellence. Uh, the president and other things. So we will work together, together with the dean of students to see how we can respond. Because I think the problem with that whole thing about sexual harassment and so forth is that there are no channels through which these young ladies can express themselves without fearing repercussions. And so I've been very, very strong on those community structures. I've been very, very strong on the representation of uh, professors. Thank you very much.